So imagine you come home from a hard day's work, there's nothing in the refrigerator, and you have a craving for Mexican food. No problema. Just call the taco copter. The drone that will bring steaming hot tacos to your doorstep in record time. That is, if the company can figure out how to keep them hot, how to keep the drones from crashing into telephone wires, how to stop a thief from stealing your tacos, or worse yet, stealing your tacos and the taco copter. Drones are simply remotely piloted flying machines with cameras. They can be as small as a hummingbird or as big as an airplane. They can, in the future years, be used for all kinds of things, like delivering your packages from Amazon, dropping medicines in isolated areas, preventing forest fires, tracking endangered species, predicting weathered patterns, finding your lost grandfather, or taking dramatic footage of your prowess on the ski slopes. But drones have another side, a dangerous side. They can be used to stalk celebrities, or they could stalk you. They could drop bombs, they could shoot tear gas, they could collide into buildings or crash with passenger jets, they could spread anthrax. So it's not the technology that's the problem, it's the use of it. And we better figure out the dangerous uses before it's too late. Because the Federal Aviation Administration in this country has been mandated to open up our airspace to drones by 2015. Already, there are hundreds of police departments that are lined up to purchase drones. And it's predicted that in the coming decade, there might be 30,000 drones in our airspace. Right now, there are only three countries that are using weaponized drones. That's the United States, the UK, and Israel. But there is already a multi-billion dollar arms race in drones, and over 50 countries now have some kind of drone. Most of them used for surveillance, but some are in the process of weaponizing their drones. The major uses of weaponized drones right now are the CIA and the military. Their drones are called Predator and Reaper drones and they're equipped with Hellfire missiles. They're piloted right here in the United States at military bases, but they're used for surveillance or to track and sometimes kill people who are thousands of miles away, in war zones like Afghanistan, or in places where we are not at war, like Pakistan, Yemen, or Somalia. Our government tells us that these drones are precise and efficient way to combat terrorism. It keeps our soldiers safe, and that there are very few civilian casualties. But let's take a closer look. It's October 24th, 2012, a beautiful sunny day in rural town in Waziristan, the tribal areas of Pakistan. 68-year-old Manama Bibi is out in the fields with her grandchildren, teaching them how to pick okra. The only thing unnatural about the scene is the constant buzzing of drones overhead due to the presence of the Taliban in that region. All of a sudden, there's a deafening blast. There's dust and smoke everywhere, screaming, limbs flying. Manama Bibi has been blown to bits by a Hellfire missile and eight members of her family are rushed to the hospital. A Pakistani official said maybe the target was meant to be a Taliban vehicle, but the closest road was a quarter of a mile away. Nobody came to investigate. Nobody came to explain. Bibi's husband was so distraught that today he rarely speaks or leaves the house. Her grandchildren live in fear that they too will be killed by a drone. Her 13-year-old grandson, whose leg was injured in the strike, said, I no longer love blue skies. Now I prefer gray skies. The drones don't fly when the skies are gray. 
In my travels overseas, I've heard similar tragic stories. In Pakistan, I met Kareem Khan, whose village home was blown up by a U.S. drone, killing his 18-year-old son and his brother. His brother, a local school teacher, taught his students that education was more powerful than weapons. The drone that killed his brother taught the students a very different lesson. In Yemen, I met Mohammed al Gawi. His 34-year-old brother was driving a taxi, picked up two passengers, and a half hour later, the taxi was just a smoldering pile of metal. When Mohammed rushed to the scene, he found only scattered parts of his brother, who left behind a young wife and three children who would never again see their father. Mohammed, a traditional tribesman, said to me, in my culture, if you make a terrible mistake or commit a crime, you have to acknowledge what you did, you have to apologize, and you have to compensate the family. Could it be that my culture, he said, is more advanced when it comes to justice than the United States of America? With the advent of drones, the US president becomes prosecutor, judge, jury, and executioner in a secret court with no accountability and no transparency. It's painful to think that Barack Obama, who is a constitutional lawyer, would rely so heavily on drones. His administration has authorized more drone attacks in one year than the Bush administration did in five years. In Pakistan, there have been 350 drone strikes, killing somewhere between 2,500 and 3,500 people, almost 200 of them children. Only 2% were high-level Taliban or Al-Qaeda. So who were the rest? Innocent people or low-level militants, most of whom had no intention or ability to attack America or Americans, most of whom could have been caught and given the right to a trial. So the United States is setting this example of using drones to go anywhere it wants, any time it wants, to kill people. What is this example setting for the rest of the world? Even when the US kills high-level militants, it could still be counterproductive. For example, on November 1st, 2012, a US drone killed Hakimullah Massoud, he was the number one leader of the Pakistani Taliban. But the Pakistani government had been trying for months to bring that group to the negotiating table to end over a decade of violence. That drone strike scuttled the peace talk, and a more hardline militant was put in Massoud's place. Drones not only kill innocent people, they terrorize entire populations with their buzzing and hovering overhead. When I visited Gaza, I met a young girl who said, it's like having a bee in your head, you just can't get it out, and it's terrifying, and you think that drone is out to get you, but you have no idea when or where. There was a study done by NYU and Stanford Law Schools that said the mere presence of drones disintegrates the fabric of a community. That parents are afraid to send their children to school, people are afraid to go to community meetings like weddings and funerals. In fact, just in December, the CIA mistook a group of cars that were on their way to a wedding for an Al-Qaeda convoy and blew up the wedding, killing 12 people. A woman that I met, a political leader in Yemen, said, in my region, there are 250,000 people. You are terrifying all of those people with the drones to get at one or two people who could be captured. She said, in your war on terror, you are terrorizing us. Drones fuel anti-American sentiment, and they have become a key recruiting tool for Al-Qaeda. 
In Yemen, there were maybe 200 people associated with extremist organizations when Obama started to use the drones in 2009, and today there are over 1,000, and with every drone strike, more and more people join al-Qaeda to seek revenge. Worldwide, 10 years of drones has not eliminated al-Qaeda. In fact, it's increased. Now there's a significant presence in Syria, in Iraq, in Northern Africa, and in West Africa. Drones undermine the rule of law. Ben Emerson, who is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism, said that states have an obligation when feasible to capture terrorist suspects and give them trials and can only use lethal force in the face of an imminent threat. But the U.S. is using these drones to kill people who might someday, maybe, somehow kill Americans, and that is not the definition of imminent. If other countries were to take this broad-based definition that the United States has and kill people anywhere they want, we'd be living in a world of chaos. Drones have been called dangerously seductive because governments think that they have a strategy for combating terrorism when they're only moving the focal point from one place to another and keeping us in a state of perpetual war. The use of drones also keeps us from looking for other alternatives, non-violent alternatives that could lead to real solutions, like negotiations, peace talks, alliance building, using our funding for education, promoting women's organizations, strengthening judicial systems and rehabilitation centers, treating terrorism as criminal acts that should lead to arrests and trials, and using our military to defend us here at home instead of creating more enemies overseas. Now for the good news. There is a movement around the world that is building to stop the proliferation of drones for killing and for spying. Here in the United States, people are out protesting on a regular basis in front of the White House, the CIA, the Pentagon, Congress, at the military bases where the drones are being piloted. We're going into universities and libraries, churches and mosques to educate people and anticipating the opening up of our airspace for drones, cities and states all over the country are passing legislation to restrict their use. Some Tea Party activists are going even further, threatening to shoot snooping drones out of the sky. In Europe, people are pushing their governments not to purchase weaponized drones. In Pakistan and Yemen, they're passing legislation calling drone strikes illegal and trying to use their courts to seek redress. And there are debates on the floor of the United Nations with calls for accountability and transparency. Already, we are having an impact. When there was a Washington Post poll that was done in February of 2012, it showed that 83% of the American people supported the use of drones to kill terrorist suspects overseas. By 2013, that had dropped to 60%. And the government is feeling the pressure. Whereas before the Obama administration refused to even acknowledge the use of drones, now President Obama has gone to the public to assure them that he is trying to cut down on civilian casualties and the number of drone strikes. In Pakistan, the number of strikes has decreased from 128 in 2012 to 26 strikes last year. We have to do more, and it's only a mobilized, organized, global citizenry that will stop the normalization of drones for killing and for spying. And we must do that because it will affect not only the future of warfare, but how we live together as a community of nations. In Yemen, I met a young journalist who had a fatwa put on her head by al-Qaeda because she had the nerve to say that politics and religion were a deadly mix. I said to her, you must hate al-Qaeda and be in favor of the drones. 
No, she answered. I hate Al-Qaeda, and I hate the drones. I think Al-Qaeda are thugs and criminals. They ought to be captured, tried, and thrown into prison. When you kill them with drones, she said, you turn them into martyrs. She said drones were a barbaric way of killing and should have no future in a democratic Yemen. I agree. I think drones are a barbaric way of killing and had, should have no future in the civilized societies. Stopping drone killings would be the best way to honor Mamama Bibi and all the other innocent victims. As her 13-year-old grandson said when he had a chance to address Congress, he said, I hope by coming here and explaining what is happening in my community and the death of my grandfather, mother, you'll understand that drones are not the answer. I hope I can go back to my community and tell people there that the American people listened and they want to help us. And I hope that one day, someday, America will stop killing people with drones. Thank you very much. Thank you.